Greetings and welcome to another lecture in comparative psychology. This chapter, of course, deals with anti-predator behavior. What we talked about before in the prior lecture was what do prey animals do to try to avoid being detected by a predator? Because, of course, that is the first thing that animals will do. It's just best, you know, to not be detected in the first place. But then the question, of course, is what do they do once they are detected? What are some of the things that prey do when they are detected? They do all sorts of things. And we seem anyway, it, it looks like they do it because when they detect prey, they feel afraid. And and I, I've talked about this before with the, with the anthropomorphication and that researchers don't like to say that animals are feeling anxiety. But quite frankly, when it comes to mice anyway, there's been a lot of research looking at brain activity, what parts become active and what happens in the brain, and it sure as heck looks like what we would in humans call anxiety. So, yes, you know, I've talked before about how I tend to be more likely to go with the anthropomorphication, at least to a point. So I don't think that it would be too much of a stretch to say that for mammals, at least, that when they detect a predator, they feel anxiety. And so then what do they do? One of the first things they might do, and perhaps the best thing to do at the time, is run. Whether it's actually running or flying or creeping or swimming or whatever it is, they want to get the hell out of Dodge because they want to get away from that predator as quickly and easily as they can. The thing is, though, that the animal wants to be very, very careful about how they flee and when they flee. Remember, I was talking about how motion is very, very easy to detect for a lot of predators. So in a way, they kind of rely on their prey to flee. Once the prey flee, then the predator can detect them and at least theoretically catch them more easily. So prey actually don't always run like hell as soon as they detect a predator. It depends on a number of different variables. For instance, how quickly a prey animal decides to flee depends at least in part on if there is a refuge nearby and how close it is. If an animal has a safe place and it's far from its safe place, it's going to flee a lot faster than those that are closer to their safe place. And again, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You know, I sometimes think about when I'm outside during a lightning storm or I hear thunder. And having lived in Florida, I know that when thunder roars, you go indoors because you don't want to get hit by lightning. Uh, but if it, I'm close to home, I may not go inside until the storm is more or less right on top of me. On the other hand, if I'm taking a walk and all of a sudden I notice a storm is coming, I'm going to start moving a whole lot faster to make sure that I get to my refuge before it gets me. So, yep, animals from that far from a refuge flee faster. Another thing that should probably be greeted with a resounding chorus of duh is that animals that are distracted are slower to flee. Yes, thank you, I'll be here all week. No kidding. Yes, if an animal is busy foraging, if an animal is busy trying to find a mate, if an animal is busy fighting other animals, if an animal is busy, you know, dealing with its offspring, it's going to be slower to flee than animals that are not distracted. A uh, part of that may simply be that the animal that is distracted may not notice the predator. Part of it may simply be that an animal that is distracted wants to finish the job up before it leaves. Again, I give you the lightning example. If I'm not doing much of anything and I hear thunder, I go inside right away. But if I'm busy doing something, I might, you know, wait a little bit to finish what I'm doing or at least get to a good stopping place before I go inside. And why should animals, other animals, be different? Aspects of the predator itself can also play a role in how quickly an animal flees. If it's a big predator, animals are probably going to flee quicker than if it's a small one. If it's coming directly toward them, they're more likely to flee than if it's coming at an angle. If there's a possibility that the predator may not detect the prey, then the prey may just hold still and hope for the best. 
because, of course, remember, fleeing too soon or fleeing too abruptly or fleeing too drastically might indeed pull the attention of the predator. When if the animal had just hunkered down and hoped that other animal would pass by, it might have stand, stood a much better chance of not being detected. If an animal is armored or has camouflage, that also slows fleeing, probably because the animal assumes, the prey assumes, that even if it's detected by the predator, that the armor or whatever it has protecting itself can basically ward off the predator. A lot of animals, I mean, animals like porcupines, porcupines don't generally flee for nothing. And it's not that they're completely invulnerable. There are certain types of birds, for instance, that have learned that the vulnerable place of a porcupine is its belly. They do get preyed upon occasionally, but for the most part, animals that have encountered a porcupine don't want anything more to do with it. And animals that encounter a porcupine uh, usually don't want, they usually they leave very quickly. Let's put it that way. Skunks is somewhat similar. Um, if the animal is camouflaged, as, I, as I've said a couple of times before, it may simply rely on not being able to be seen by the predator in the hope that the predator will pass it by. And then I also include the things like hunger. That, that goes up with the feeding stuff that was actually under the second point. Um, I decided to add it in again. I'm not entirely sure. I like to drive things home. <laughs> now, in terms of driving things home, I don't normally talk about the sidebars because the sidebars themselves are usually interestingly enough, and you can understand them well enough that you could go there. But I think that the headline here is a bit misleading. The headline was Heritability of Condition to Fear Responses. And since I've spent all of my career basically saying, well, you can't inherit a conditioned response. You can't inherit it. It's something that is learned. Conditioned responses are learned. And so I looked at it a little more carefully and in a little more detail and found that indeed, although it was a bit vague, that they agreed with me that what an individual responds to is not necessarily what is inherited. In that, <coughs> oh, excuse me, excuse me, another hairball. In that, um, Actually, I'm going to take a little break just a second. Okay, let's try this again without coughing. What the individual responds to is not what it is inherited. They don't inherit a fear of uh, dogs or a fear of hawks or a fear of whatever. They don't inherit that, most of them. They have to, they have to learn that. But how they respond, how they respond to this uh, predator, and how quickly they learn that is, okay, whether they respond by fleeing or hiding or uh, some mice and rats uh, defecate or they, or they freeze or they uh, respond physiologically, those are inherited. Inherited it? Yes, they are inherited it. <laughs> and also how quickly they learn it. We talked about this again in the learning chapter. When we talked about preparedness, that we're basically born prepared to be afraid of things that does seem to be inherited. And it also does seem to be true for other animals other than humans. The researchers talked about mice, for instance. And I looked this up outside of the text a bit to clarify it. How the mice react to predators. Exactly how they react to predators. You can actually breed mice to, when they sent a predator, to freeze Sorry, my cat just walked over the screen. <laughs> Let me go back there. You can actually breed them in terms of, you know, if you want, if you want uh, mice that freeze, you take, you expose a bunch of predators, or <laughs> a bunch of mice to the scent of predators. You take the mice that freeze when they scent a predator. You breed them together until eventually you have mice that not only only freeze when they scent a predator as opposed to running away, but they also do it very quickly. So it kind of makes sense. Those that survive by reacting in a certain way, given their environment and their predators, wind up having offspring that then respond in the same way, presumably to do well in the same environment. So I do just want to point out again that you can't inherit a fear of dogs or a fear of, of whatever, but you do inherit perhaps how you respond 
and how quickly. Another thing that prey animals do when they encounter predators, which you may not expect, is they'll actually approach them. They'll actually go toward the predators. And there, there's method in this madness because going toward the predators allows the prey to collect important information, information that may actually help the prey to survive this encounter with the predator. First of all, they get information about the predator. Does the predator notice them? How big is it? How fast are they moving? How hungry the predator is, you know, because they look at how the predator reacts. Um, so they get more information about the predator that can be useful. They also let the predator know that it's been seen. This is one of the things you might see in birds, for instance. A lot of birds with the mobbing behavior that I showed uh you, you hopefully watched the video up in the prior chapter, that we have, um, actually, no, it's actually, it's coming up, I apologize. We'll be talking about mobbing a little bit later, but what a lot of birds will do when they see a predator is they will actually ca make calls and sometimes they'll swarm the predator to let the predator know it's been seen. And what happens a lot of times when prey indicate that they've seen a predator, is the predator will then move on. Because if the predator is hoping to sneak up on its prey, it just lost that opportunity. It just lost that advantage. And in a lot of cases, I've, I've seen this in, uh, in some more of those wildlife documentaries where lions will be sneaking up on a bank gang of antelope. And if the antelopes show that they see the predator, by their behavior, the lion will just move on. It also lets others in the group, if this is a social living animal, know that there's a predator nearby. One of the things that antelopes do when they see a predator is they do what's called stotting. And stotting is interesting uh, because what stotting is, is it's jumping straight up in the air, basically uh, using all four legs. So it's not leaping using its hind legs, they'll, they'll go straight up in the air. And it's almost like bouncing. It's like bouncing. And antelope will often bounce. And the bouncing not only tells the predator that they've been seen, but it tells other antelope that there is a prey nearby. Okay? It tells the antelope there's a predator nearby. There is a lion. There is something that is nearby, and you need to watch out. And so then those antelope will start stotting, and pretty soon everybody's headed for the proverbial hills. And as I mentioned before, this may end with the predator retreating, the predator realizing that it simply, you know, it's lost its chance. Or sometimes it can end with the prey actually attacking the predator. More about that in the next video.